So now let me uh, start this uh, new topic. So in the next few weeks, we will talk about uh, trend film uh, technology, and I'll talk about uh, four of them. So we'll start uh, with uh, SIGS, which is a very upcoming uh, technology, and we have a guest speaker uh, from this company, Stein, which is a startup which makes these six cells. And then we'll talk about uh, Cattail, which is made by First Solar. Then we'll talk about uh, uh, organic cells. And uh, uh, we'll also talk about this amorphous silicon uh, cells. Okay. So all of these uh, four technologies, they have one thing in common, that these all these materials which are used in these ten film based solar cells, these are amorphous materials. Okay? So these are uh, materials which don't have a regular crystal ladder. These are um, amorphous in nature. So it's good to you know look at some physics which is common to all these four things. And we will, um, I want to introduce some of that today. So uh, let me ask you know, so if you have an amorphous material, right? So should it have a band gap? I mean, should should an amorphous material have a band gap, or like does it even make sense to talk about band gap in amorphous material? So band gap usually comes along because you have this periodic lattice, right? So you have this periodically arranged uh, equal spacing between your lattice atoms. So your wave functions interact, and you get this uh, forbidden zone. You get a conduction band, and you get a valence band. But what if you know I have a material which has no, which is amorphous, right? So there's no regular crystalline structure. So would it even work for you know solar? Is there a band gap or? So okay, Ashish is using a analogy example by giving the analogy and he's saying that silicon oxide has a band gap, the band gap of around 9 EV. And he knows that it's a amorphous material. So he's saying that I know it has a band gap, but why should it have a band gap? So you're right, it has a band gap, but why should it? Yes, yeah, so sure. There's the density of states, uh, and they're separated. But why would that, you know, separation arise? So you're saying only some amorphous materials have band gap, others don't. Okay. Yes. Okay, so JP is saying that you know instead of having this uh, uh, you know ordered uh, lattice over a very large distance, you usually have these small microstructures which have these uh, periodic arrangements, right? And so what he's talking about is is polycrystalline material, right? Uh, are you talking about a polycrystalline material? Or? So a polycrystalline material, for example, it has. Uh, you know, it has uh, these grains which are could be may, very large at times, but they have uh, nicely arranged atoms, and they are all you know have equal spacing. But that occurs on a smaller scale. But each of these uh, each of these grains has uh, these atoms arranged in a periodic fashion, so it will have a band gap. But what if if I you know let's assume if I have no long range order, I have you know amorphous material which has uh, no no order going, you know, it does not have these grains, it just it's completely amorphous. Would I have a band gap there? Hmm. 
you're talking about molecules, I guess. You know. So molecules, uh, yeah, they have. Uh, uh, so let's just talk about you know things like uh, individual uh, atoms or have like uh, you know, amorphous silicon or SIGs, right? These are not these are not gases which have you know homonuclear homo orbitals. So these are just individual atoms. Okay, so I think we've gathered enough uh, enough uh, points to you know discuss about amorphous material. So the band gap in these uh, amorphous material arises because of this term, which is called the uh, continuous random network. And these continuous and random are adject adjectives you usually don't use at the same time, but it's uh, it's very important to understand these uh, amorphous materials. So in amorphous materials. Uh, in if you arrange them in a 3d fashion you can essentially arrange them so that you know on the first or the second neighbor basis they still have uh, order but that order disappears if you go beyond that uh, first or second neighbor this kind of arrangement is not uh, possible if you are doing it on a 1d or a 2d level but it's not possible if you're doing it on a 1d level but if you are arranging atoms in a 3d level you can still have them ordered to the way first or second neighbor uh, uh, kind of uh, distance, but on a long range you don't have any order. So this is what uh, you know results uh, in a amorphous material. So shown here are some pictures so showing of these uh, continuous random networks. So if you look from a macro level, it looks completely random, right? But if you look at each of these individual atoms, it's still bonded to four of these other atoms. And there's like a small deviation in the, so the actual bond angle, if this was a tetrahedron, would have been uh, 109.5. But it's still arranged and it's still bonded with these uh, other four atoms. And that angle, it's not exactly 109.5, but it's like plus minus uh, 10 degrees from that, right? So the nearest distance atom, even though it's not constant, it varies by only a few percentage points and you can have this uh, uh, short uh, you know very small uh, range uh, order even if you have a uh, no order on the on the macro scale and that is what uh, gives you the band gap uh, in a in a amorphous material so you know in a crystalline solid if you look at you know the neighboring spaces so if you look at you know the smallest uh, uh, neighboring space then the second neighbor then the third neighbor or the fourth pair, you always see you know, a constant line. So all of your atoms, they have this delta function in which this order occurs. Versus if you compare it to a gas, you have no order, right? But in the amorphous material on the, you know, at the, at the smallest pairing level, so at these, uh, you know, levels at of the nearest uh, levels, you see that uh, there's an order and you don't see an exact delta function, but you see this, uh, that these spacings are, you know, bunched up around these values, okay? And that's what results in a close to something of a band gap in these materials, okay? So, if you look at the atomic potential of these, so you won't, you don't have an exact order, but uh, you have, you know, on, the, on your nearest level, they are still arranged like this. So you can approximate the wave function which results by this envelope function, which gives you, um, you know, which more or less resembles a crystalline material, and then this perturbation around that. Right? So you get a density of states which does not exactly go to zero, but uh, you get a density of state like this, where you have uh, uh, states available within that forbidden region as well, but uh, you have a large number of states available after a certain point, and you call that your valence band, and you have a large number of states available beyond a certain point and you call that conduction map. But you don't have like complete zero states within the band gap. You have states occurring uh, within this uh, band gap as well because there's no perfect order which will create this forbidden region, okay? So in a, in a, so coming back to what you had mentioned that, you know, usually you have these, uh, these uh, SNP orbitals and they interact to form, give you this conduction and valence band which we learned from this bonding and antibonding states. 
but uh, in this case uh, in amorphous material you get like this continuous distribution of states and uh, you pick a point and call it your uh, band edge for your conduction band and you pick a point and you call it the band edge for your uh, valence band and we'll just talk about how you pick that point okay and you have that states uh, below this in this forbidden region as well but just that their numbers or their density is very low right so you have uh, and you see that these states cause a lot of problem they increase your recombination they uh, decrease your mobility and so on but this uh, on, a, on a broad level this band structure comes along because you have this short range order even though you don't have any long range order okay so your density of states you can plot it i mean you can plot the density of number of these states as a function of energy and you'll see that you know up to a certain energy they will have this uh, square root dependence which is what you get in a crystalline material and then beyond a certain point you have this exponential dependence that is what you get uh, 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 so you know when this uh, square root dependence starts you call that point at the start of your band edge so you define this as your conduction band edge and you define similarly this as your conduction and valence band edge and for uh, say a material such as uh, uh, such as uh, amorphous silicon this uh, separation which you can call it the uh, band gap is 1.6 eV but that doesn't mean there are no states below this region so you have this tail states which extend uh, inside this forbidden region as well so this is plotting this uh, uh, on a linear scale but i can plot it on a log scale and then i see this distinction very uh, very clearly so if i plot it, plot it on a log logarithmic scale you see that over here i have this square root dependence on energy and this is what my uh, my bind states are and then I have this exponential dependence. So when I plot it uh, on a log scale, I see it, uh, you know, coming out linearly. And this is what is my tail states. Okay. And uh, interestingly, I also see these uh, these things uh, over here. And uh, these are called the dangling bond states, which I just described. So within this forbidden region, there's a lot of action happening. So there's this tail states. There are these dangling bond states. So there is a lot of physics and many times you have to invent physics because there is no real physics so you have to invent like phenomenological physics to explain what is going on over here. Because most of the semiconductor physics we know is, is you know derived assuming that you have a band structure, you have this effective mass, you have you know mobility and all these things. These concepts don't hold for amorphous materials. So people usually who are used to that mindset of working with uh, crystal materials they want to use a similar set of equations so you know they try to define a similar looking physics for these materials and they make up phenomenological models to explain them some of which i will just tell you so other thing which happens in this uh, continuous random network is that uh, you know you have you want to have uh, all of your four uh, uh, bonds for each uh, silicon uh, to be you know made with another silicon atoms but that doesn't happen always so you have what is called these uh, coordination defect where you know just due to geometry it's not possible for that other one of these silicon atoms to bond with this uh, other four uh, silicon atoms so you get this coordination defect so in a crystalline material you all know that you know when an atom leaves you get this interstitial and you get this vacancy and people know how to how to define them very well but when you get these coordination defects you get these dangling bonds and you know there's no um, it gives rise to a very interesting uh, physics so these uh, states that are used, I just uh, showed you you know these uh, these uh, two uh, uh, two dumbbells over here these states comes due to these dangling bonds and you can see they are located right in the middle of the band gap and these are because you have this uh, coordination defects and they give rise to these states, uh, which are these uh, dynamic states. Other thing you see is that uh, <coughs> these states, you know, there, there are these two of these uh, uh, dumbbells, and they are separated uh, by this distance uh, u, and they are, you know, they are similar-looking distribution. And in one case, I have labeled them uh, positive and zero, and other case, I have labeled them uh, zero and negative, right? And you can see a very interesting thing that at one energy level, right, at say let's say this energy level, 
I have two of these states. So usually in a semiconductor at one energy level, you only have one state. But in this case, you have your multiple of these states at each energy level. That's another interesting thing. 